I'm Robert Kasdan, Senior Executive Vice President of Columbia University, and by, on behalf of the university, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's summit. We're very pleased that New York City's Global Partner Summits have become something of a fixture at Columbia University every autumn. Some might say tradition, but for a 257-year-old university, we use the word tradition lightly. This, in fact, marks the fifth time that Columbia has enjoyed the privilege of co-hosting the Global Partner Summit. Each gathering is an opportunity for Columbia community and each of you to hear from Mayor Bloomberg, good morning, Mr. Mayor, to engage top officials from leading cities from around the world, I believe we have seven mayors in addition to Mayor Bloomberg here today, and to address the most important policy matters of our time. Several people deserve our thanks before we get started for providing this opportunity to all of us. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Mayor Michael Bloomberg, the 108th mayor of the city of New York, who has led this city through some extremely difficult times and has known that by unleashing the creativity and energy of the people of the city, we will make it through strong Since October of 2009, the nation has gained back one out of every four jobs lost in the Great Recession. In New York City, essentially all of the jobs lost have been recovered, and for that we're grateful. I'd like to may welcome back my good friend, Commissioner Marjorie Tiven, the driving force behind transforming and then growing this important annual forum in which we convene to talk about such important policy matters. I'd like to welcome back again the man we affectionately think of as the other mayor, Mayor Feldberg. Mayor Feldberg, the president of Global Partners, is the Dean Emeritus of Columbia University Business School, a school which he led for 15 years. We are grateful to have him back every time he returns to this campus, and in particular for his leadership of today's forum. And finally, Professor Esther Fuchs of Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. We loaned Esther to the mayor during his first term, and while in public service, she showed her extraordinary combination of independence and insight. That having been said, we're grateful to have her back. I also want to thank Jeffrey Immelt for joining us this morning. As most of you know, Mr. Immelt is General Electric's Chief Executive and the Chair of President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness. Mr. Immelt has been named one of the world's best CEO three times by Barron's, and since he began serving as Chief Executive Officer, GE has been named America's most admired company in a poll conducted by Fortune and one of the world's most respected companies in polls by Barron's and Financial Times. Thank you for joining us. A key to the success of these summits has been the ability of its organizers to anticipate the most pressing issues of the day and then focus the enormous energy represented by the people in this room on the task of responding to the challenges. Yet, it is surely the case that identifying today's subject, business innovation, entrepreneurship, and job creation was not a difficult chore. And just as the need for job growth has never been greater, at least in our lifetimes, I believe it is also clear to city leaders around the world that turning to great research universities and colleges will provide one of the primary engines for economic growth. There are several reasons for this is so, why this is so. First, universities are large employers in their own right, and in most cases are adding to their employment roles, not reducing them. Columbia University is the seventh largest non-governmental employer in New York City, with 17,000 full and part-time employees, and over two-thirds of those people live in the city of New York. Second, the campus expansion which universities pursue as they continue to make new discoveries 
and educate more students, create large numbers of construction jobs and full-time jobs. For example, the building of Columbia's new campus in West, Har West Harlem, an initiative that would not have succeeded without the support of Mayor Bloomberg, will generate over 1,200 construction jobs a year during the life of the project and result in 6,000 permanent jobs with benefits and with career paths. And third, great research universities continue to deliver the scientific breakthroughs that lead to technology driven startup companies and establish new sectors of the innovation economy. We create the intellectual capital that is really the bedrock of future growth. For example, in less than two decades, Columbia University has generated 128 startup companies, 81 of which are still in existence, and has established one of the highest rates for translating research dollars into new products and businesses of any university in the country. Columbia's culture of entrepreneurship is diverse and far-reaching, as reflected by our faculty's cumulative record of 4,000 inventions, 1,800 patents, and 500 licenses. This pace of innovation continues. It's not a relic of the past. Each year, on average, Columbia manages 300 new inventions from faculty, executes 50 to 70 license agreements, launches 15 new companies, and generates in excess of $135 million a year in gross licensing revenue. We don't do this in isolation. Columbia collaborates regularly with the Bloomberg administration, the Partnership for the City of New York, the New York Academy of Sciences, and others to promote New York City as a hub of technology-based entrepreneurship. We at Columbia University understand as well that the mayor's view that New York City's past progress is traceable to the city's history as the creative and intellectual capital of the United States. And we certainly understand his call for a rededication to the city's legacy of innovation, entrepreneurship, scientific research, and technological leadership. Indeed, Columbia University is already part of that resurgence. With that in mind, it is appropriate that we gather here today at the, this university to discuss the subjects of innovation, development, and job creation. This morning, we're looking forward to what promises to be an informative day of conversation about the most creative approaches employed by cities around the world for spurring economic development. To lead us off this morning, Please welcome Mayor Feldberg, as I said, the current president of the New York City Global Partners and a senior advisor to Morgan Stanley, Dean Emeritus of Columbia Business School, where he served 15 years as dean, and a personal friend who I admire and respect greatly. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction, Rob. It's uh, always an honor and a pleasure for me to be on this campus. The first time I was on this campus was almost 50 years ago as a graduate student, and there is no greater space than this particular room uh, in our city of New York. It is an honor for me as president of the Board of New York City Global Partners to welcome everybody here today. This summit, as you heard from Rob, marks the fifth Global Partners Summit that Columbia has co-sponsored and we greatly value our relationship with this extraordinarily world-class university. We also would like to thank the World Bank who joins us as a co-sponsor, and this event would not have happened without the generous support of GE. And I do say very generous support, Jeff, it was wonderful. Uh, a special welcome to the 13 or 14 city commissioners and deputy mayors who are with us today. We're always delighted to have so many members of the city administration join us for the summit. Today marks the 10th Global Partners Summit convened by the Bloomberg administration. As the global economic recession continues, the work of these summits has become increasingly important and I'm particularly pleased that so many cities keep returning for these summits. In other words, we have cities that have come three, four times in the last five years because 
they learn as much from each other and from New York as they do in their own city. So they keep coming back, which I think is a reinforcement of the value and the importance of these summits. Today's summits will focus on what cities are doing around the world to promote business development through innovation and entrepreneurship. All of it focused, of course, on creating jobs for the 21st century. Represented here today are international delegates from Bangalore and Barcelona, from Berlin and Bucharest, Budapest and Buenos Aires, Cape Town, Geneva and Ho Chi Minh City, Istanbul, Johannesburg and Karachi, Kiev, Lisbon and Luxembourg, Lyon, Montreal, Munich and Panama City, Stockholm, Tel Aviv and Tokyo, a truly global representation. And I hope I will be forgiven for singling out that there are two mayors here, one from Johannesburg, the city in which I was born and grew up, and a mayor from Cape Town, a city in which my family lived for 10 years when I was dean of the business school at the University of Cape Town. So I'm delighted to have two South African mayors with us today. We have a group of other mayors with us today, and I would like to introduce them. We have the mayor of Bangalore, the mayor of Bucharest, of Budapest, of Geneva, and of Ho Chi Minh City, as well as Johannesburg and Cape Town. This morning, it is my pleasure to introduce and moderate a conversation between two great innovators, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, the 108th mayor of New York City, and Jeffrey Immelt, the chairman and CEO of GE, and as you all know, chair of President Obama's Job Council. So I'm first going to introduce Jeff Immelt, and I will invite Jeff Immelt to speak to us for about five to seven minutes. He will then take his seat on the stage. I will then Im introduce the mayor of New York City, and he will speak to for five to seven minutes and take his seat on the stage. And then I will pose a series of questions to our two guest speakers, and they will have a conversation around these issues. So let me first introduce Jeff Immelt. Jeff Immelt graduated with a BA from Dartmouth in Applied Mathematics and an MBA from Harvard Business School. He assumed the top position at GE in September 2001, 10 years ago. He has positioned GE as a global leader in multiple industries, including power, energy, healthcare, transportation, and infrastructure development. Jeff leads an iconic company with over 300,000 employees in more than 100 countries. As a member of the board of the Robin Hood Foundation here in New York City, Jeff has worked with other business leaders on programs focused on reducing poverty. President Obama recognized Jeff Immelt as an effective job creator when he appointed him chair of the President's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness in January this year. Please help me welcome Jeff Immelt. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh... It's easy to say uh, thanks and welcome to the two mayors, uh, Feldman and Mayor Bloomberg, but it's my honor to be here uh, with you this morning representing GE to have a conversation about uh, innovation and about the uh, city's role in innovation. I, I, I just really, to, to frame my perspective, I'd make three overall points. Uh, the first one is that a lot of innovation uh, in the coming years will be around companies, uh, both big and small, creating solutions to big, I would say, social and demographic issues. And this is something that uh, really GE has worked on for much of the last uh, decade. And we've picked uh, two what I would call big themes. One is clean energy and the notion that we could make innovative products, we could generate, uh, produce jobs, we could do it economically, and we could improve the environment at the same time. Green is green. And we launched that in 2005. And when we launched that, we had about $5 billion of revenue in those products. Today, we have $21 billion of revenue in those products. It's about 20% of our industrial company. And we've done that by more than doubling our R&D. And we've done that by uh, progressing from a technical standpoint. We've done that by uh, uh, doing this in every corner of the world. So that, that's an initiative we call Ecoimagination. Three years ago, we launched an initiative called Health Imagination. And this is about affordable health care. And we said we were going to uh, focus uh, $3 billion of R&D on products that improve cost, quality, and access in health care. 
that we felt like this was going to be important, not just in the U.S., but on a global basis, and that we thought if we could improve healthcare delivery at a low cost and healthcare innovation at a low cost, it would help our business grow. And this is roughly half of the R&D that we do in our healthcare business. Uh, it's allowed us to really uh, lead in market share in the emerging markets around the world in healthcare, but it's also helped us really improve our presence in hospitals here. So affordable health care, clean energy, big problems like this are, are ways that companies can innovate, produce a good return for our investors, and solve big problems at the same time. And I'm convinced that's the way in which these innovations have to be treated. In order to do this frequently, you need to offer a solution. And almost all the time, uh, some form of government is going to interface with the work you do. And so as we've done this over the past six or seven years, we've done more work with cities. And in many ways, cities can provide, I'd say, the, the, the most effective form of government to partner with in clean energy and affordable health care. So we've increased our effort to understand how cities can innovate. And Mike has been on the leading edge of both of these, both clean energy and affordable health care. Uh, smart grid technology that you all read about, electric vehicle technology that you all read about, these are really city solutions. You know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're working on big smart grid projects in Miami, Florida, a big smart grid project in Rotterdam, uh, several of, uh, cities in China. Uh, you know, they're not national programs, that's too, that's too grand. You need to focus on uh, city solutions. So a lot of clean energy is going to be driven by working with cities, and particularly in the area of grid management, grid productivity, and electric vehicle. So cities are now a, 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 an important partner. The other point I'd make about cities is in the area of affordable health care. There's no such thing, it, not just in the U.S., but anywhere, as, na a, 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 as national health care. We don't have one health care market in the United States. We have 50 city health care markets. So if you're going to work on things like affordable health care in the U.S., you're going to do it in cities. In our case, in GE, 15 cities count, and those are the ones that we're driving affordable health care programs uh, in. And, and the place where we're pioneering is really in the city of Cincinnati, which has the highest density of, uh, of GE uh, employees and retirees. So solutions are a great way to innovate. Cities are particularly good partners with, which, uh, to, with, with whom to innovate with because they offer the, the local solution that's required. The third point I'd make on these big solution sets is that they require partnerships between big companies and small companies. We've had two innovation challenges. We did a smart grid challenge about 18 months ago where we basically said to entrepreneurs and startup companies, here's our vision for the smart grid. We'd like your ideas. We got over 4,000 ideas. We're making more than 30 investments in these companies from outright, outright acquisitions to strategic partnerships, and these are startup companies. Similarly, we did the same thing about two months ago in, uh, in breast cancer. Again, calling out to the entrepreneurial community to help us offer better solutions, lower cost solutions in the marketplace. So big solutions count. Cities are great partners. They're big and small company uh, collaborators. Those are the three points I'd make just to frame uh, this discussion. The last thing is I, I want to uh, shamelessly merchandise the Jobs Council. Uh, this is the interim report we gave to President Obama about two weeks ago. It's very specific. It's very focused. Uh, you know, we, we really set it up to try to avoid the need for bipartisan legislation. <laughs> there are many things that can happen just with the private sector and the public sector uh, acting. Uh, five big areas. Uh, infrastructure, you know, which is something that creates jobs and, and is desperately needed. Uh, sponsoring high growth companies. You know, 40 million jobs in the U.S. since 1980 have really been created by high growth enterprises, not, not specifically small business. The job creation in this country are companies like Bloomberg and Amazon and Microsoft. These are the guys that have really, the, these high growth enterprises, and how can the U.S. be uh, great at that? Uh, a national investment initiative, both to help our exports, but also to, to convince companies to, to, to execute and invest here. Uh, the fourth thing is regulatory simplification that's important. And number five, uh, education. And one of the focuses in education is each year to increase the number of engineers that are graduating by 10,000. We graduate about 135,000 engineers every year. 
China and India combined graduate a million engineers every year. We want to create jobs and we want to drive exports. We've got to change that equation. So that's the work that I hope you've seen or, or uh, can, uh, can download on, on jobs. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today. And uh, Mary, I look forward to a great discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I was remarking to Jeff Immelt that this is probably the fourth or fifth time that I've introduced him to an audience at uh, Columbia University, but in the past it was always to uh, students at the business schools. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who, like Jeff, also went to that other business school. <laughs> Mayor Mike, like Jeff, knows a little bit about entrepreneurship and innovation. In 1981, over 30 years ago, he founded a small tech startup company and gave it the unlikely name Bloomberg LP. I think at the time, Mr. Mayor, you started with a half a dozen people, Bloomberg LP. I also understand that uh, some of your advisors at that time suggested that you give the company a generic name rather than uh, Bloomberg LP. Uh, you did not listen to them, and that's a good lesson for all the entrepreneurs in this room. Seek advice, but use your own judgment. Well, you all know the rest of the story about Bloomberg LP. It is now a global media company that currently employs over 13,000 people in 160 countries. Since its founding 30 years ago, Bloomberg LP has employed almost 30,000 individuals, the vast majority of whom live in global cities around the world. Mike is a one-man job creator. Today, Michael Bloomberg leads a global city of nearly 8.5 million people, arguably one of the greatest cities on earth. New York City has approximately 300,000 employees, a budget of $66 billion, and a school system where more languages are spoken than are spoken at the United Nations. Mayor Mike has made New York City a leader in innovation and entrepreneurship and in job creation, and I know he will be telling us more about this during the morning. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mayor Michael R. Bloomberg, the United States Mayor. Thank you. Um, it is true that uh, Jeff and I went to another business school, but he went to undergraduate school with somebody I live with, and she is a graduate of your business yeah. school, so we have a connection. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for that kind introduction and also for all you do for our city as president of Global Partners. And Jeff, uh, welcome. Now, if I could just get you to move all of your facilities from Cincinnati to New York, <laughs> it'll be mission accomplished. Uh, let me also thank Columbia University Senior Vice President Robert Kasten and the Columbia community for hosting and co-sponsoring this event. Uh, I'm on a number of uh, boards together with Robert, and he is one of the great corporate citizens, does an enormous amount for our city and uh, has been very helpful in working with our Deputy Mayor Bob Steele and president of EDC, our Economic Development Commission, Seth Pinsky. So uh, Columbia is not just one of the greatest universities in the world that's located here. It really is a part of our city, and uh, their success is our success. Um, and also let me thank my sister, uh, the city's commissioner for the United Nations Consular Corps and Protocol. I think she has the distinction of leading the agency with the longest name, uh, but it's also an agency that has an enormous amount to do with the success of this city because the diplomatic community here in New York is a great part of our economic success, uh, but also it's New York's opportunity to speak to the world and to learn from the world through the United Nations and through all of the embassies and consulates that are here. Uh, Marjorie also is, this is her 10th year of uh, working with this summit and uh, in my book that means she scored a perfect 10. Most of you aren't old enough to remember the movie 10, but that's another issue. <laughs> because if you did, it would be a lot funnier than what the response I got. Uh, this year, uh, she had the able assistance of Seth Pinsky, and I also want to thank those, uh, thank Columbia and uh, those who joined with Columbia in co-sponsoring this, the World Bank, uh, GE, and its chair. And uh, without corporate sponsorship, most of these things shouldn't work. So. 
while you can give some business to GE, it's hard to give business to the World Bank. Uh, always have a smile on your face, at least, and tell people these are two great organizations that really are part of this country and this world's success. I also wanted to uh, take the opportunity to welcome representatives of 22 cities uh, who are here for the summit, including seven of, my f seven of my fellow mayors, who I just had the pleasure of talking with and taking pictures with and exchanging ceremonial gifts. I have enough reading material now to carry me for the next two weeks. Uh, I will report back to all of you of uh, what I've learned about your city, so thank you for doing that. Um, together, everybody here and all these cities represented represent people of widely diverse cultures and histories, and nevertheless, we all share a common heritage, and that is the spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship, and I just wanted to take a couple minutes to talk about that, because throughout history, cities in every corner of the globe have always been the magnets for talented and ambitious people, and that has made us, as Jeff pointed out, the birthplace for new ideas and new products that spur human progress and fuel economic growth. And the crucial question that we face, the focus of this summit is, what can we do to encourage that process now, despite all the economic difficulties that everybody around the world faces? And to get that uh, discussion started, let me just uh, briefly suggest five answers, and then that maybe can uh, get you thinking, if nothing else. The first is bolster the quality of life in our cities, strong public safety, excellent schools, affordable housing, attractive parks, and a vibrant cultural life. Uh, we have to think of those as economic assets of the first order. Today, financial capital and human capital in the form of skilled and talented workers are more mobile than ever. International boundaries mean less and less. And cities that offer the best quality of life will be magnets for that capital and that talent and will reap dividends in innovation and growth. Without the human capital, you just can't grow, and that's always been New York's strong point. The second imperative is promote economic diversity, especially in today's creative and emerging industries. Uh, let me tout to New York a little bit from around the globe. People think of New York as a financial center, and for good reason. Half of the world's equity flows through this city every day. But the strength of New York's economy, a key reason why we went into the last recession later and came out faster than the rest of the nation, is that our many creative and emerging industries are growing rapidly in our city as well. Dan Doktoroff, 10 years ago, started a program which the press got a little bit tired of hearing about because I worked it into every single speech, but a economic and geographical diversity, diversification in our city really has made a difference and we've grown in bioscience and media and technology, film and TV production, fashion and design. Uh, today we have twice as many fashion houses, for example, as Paris. Uh, we also rival LA as the TV production capital of America. And with those very high profile industries supporting thousands of less glamorous but very important jobs in areas ranging from catering to carpentry, they all strengthen our economy and give us a future. It gives us the tax base to improve services uh, and it gives us the ability to make the kind of investments that will ensure our city's success for the future. Third, cities should actively encourage an innovation economy. And let me just cite two examples. Uh, since many of you are undoubtedly marking, making an outline of my remarks, you can have these as subtitles A and B. I know Bob Tierney is doing that there, <laughs> along with our fire commissioner, Sal, Calis uh, Sal Cassano. Uh, many young workers in financial services firms suddenly found themselves out of work in the last downturn. But they were precisely the kind of energetic and entrepreneurial people that we wanted in New York. So one of the things uh, Bob uh, Steele and Seth Pinsky did was uh, create incubators throughout the city, places where people thinking about starting their own businesses in digital media, in fashion, and in other industries could get reduced race office space, access to business equipment, and other, also very importantly, the chance to interact with one another. Uh, some of you mayors are going to visit some of these incubators tomorrow. I cannot tell you how successful they've been. Uh, the firm started them, have already attracted $40 million in venture capital, and they've retained or created about 800 jobs with more on the way. And now for subheading B, about a year ago, we launched a competition challenging universities near and far to bring a major new applied science campus to our city. 
We have offered land to build on as well as up to $100 million in infrastructure investments to make it possible. Our reasoning? Well, the startup businesses that would spin off from that campus and the jobs that they would create would repay our initial investment many, many times over. If you go and take a look, why so many high-tech jobs are in Palo Alto or Austin or Cambridge, Massachusetts, it is because the universities there have graduated, educated young people who've gone out, started businesses, and those businesses have become the economic engines of those areas, and we want that here as well. The deadline for submissions, you should know, was last Friday. The results were beyond anything that we had imagined. Seven outstanding bids from 17 major institutions, including our host, Columbia University. And early in 2012, we'll announce who has been selected. A fourth vital way to spur innovation and urban economic growth is to welcome immigrants. Uh, for the past 20 years, the American cities, like New York, have, that have large immigrant populations have also had far and away the biggest economic growth. This is not a coincidence. Immigrants are enterprising. They're more than twice as likely as native-born Americans to start their own businesses, businesses that fuel economic growth and provide jobs to Americans who've lived here for generations. For example, despite the difficulties of starting a business in this economic climate, one area where New York City has seen major growth is in food manufacturing. There's been a 14% increase in such firms over the past three years, and typically such businesses are immigrant-owned and operated. So our Economic Development Corporation is actively working with them to help them market and sell their goods more widely. And today, later on, you'll hear from Jasmine Rodriguez, a woman who runs a city incubator for food industry startups, and will share her recipe, if you'll pardon the pun, for helping them grow. Fifth and finally, cities need to reform or eliminate policies that discourage innovation and entrepreneurship. For example, four years ago, at our urging, our state legislature significantly eased the tax burden on self-employed New Yorkers, many of whom work in the creative sectors like publishing and design, and that has put tens of millions of dollars a year back in their pockets. And believe me, nothing spurs innovation more than cash like that. And we've also cut the regulatory red tape that many small businesses face. For example, we've created business acceleration teams, we call them, that speed up the process of licensing new restaurants. And the result, more than 480 restaurants throughout the city have opened weeks or even months earlier than they would otherwise. And if you're wondering what 480 restaurants mean, we have about 25,000 restaurants in New York City, so it is a very big part of our economy. And I urge all of you who are taking part in this summer to drop into a few of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, I'm sure they can find a table for you, although if they can't, I guess that's even better news for us. Uh, they offer food to satisfy every palate, and your sales tax dollars will be much appreciated at City Hall. So thank you very much, and let me turn things back over to the real mayor here, Mayor Felberg. Thank you for those uh, two compelling presentations, and I think that uh, some of the questions that uh, I'm going to ask each of you, uh, you've already started the, uh, the answers, uh, but let me observe what both of you uh, commented on, and that is that uh, people around the world, and, and very much so in cities, have been thinking about the anemic growth that uh, the world has been experiencing, particularly the developed countries, over the course of the past uh, two years. And that's the focus of this summit. How do we get out from under this anemic growth and what role cities can uh, play in, in, in doing this? So the first question is, is addressed to, uh, to Mayor Mike Bloomberg. Uh, we heard about the innovative approaches to business development and job creation that you have initiated and that have already been executed uh, in New York City. Uh, and your last observation had to do with uh, simplifying the regulatory environment in the city so businesses could start more rapidly and become effective more quickly. Uh, so I'd like to ask you what role you think the federal government can or maybe should not play in assisting cities in innovation and in job creation? Well, I think what cities need, and businesses as well, is consistent 
understandable policies from the federal government, in our case from Washington, but it would be true around the world. Uh, if the regulations are difficult to understand or change all the time, if the tax policy is so convoluted that you can't understand it, um, if every day there are new threats and uh, new people to blame uh, for anything that went wrong in our past, it's very difficult to have a consistent policy. You need the price of energy to stay at one level for a long period of time, for example. Otherwise, we'll never become energy independent, and people aren't going to make the kind of investments to get us to energy independency and to clean up our environment. Uh, you need a tax policy that everybody understands is fair, but where everybody shares in it. Tax policies are used for encouraging economic growth or discouraging economic growth in other areas, but people have to feel that um, it's their money, and I think too many people just say it's somebody else's. Uh, regulation, every regulation was put there for a good reason, but on the other hand, the totality, it makes it sometimes impossible to uh, run a business or to run a city government. So it's not that we want them to go away. We want the federal government to provide the services that are appropriate federal, defense, um, getting guns off the streets because guns are a cross-border problem, uh, providing a lot of the uh, social services that no one city or state could afford. Uh, but when it comes to business, when it comes to commerce, that is much more a local issue. And if the federal government wants to really help, they can do the things I said in terms of consistency and um, uh, lacking complexity, and also deal with what is arguably the single greatest inhibitor to the growth of this country, and that is our crazy immigration policy, which is trying to drive business overseas it is about as misguided a policy as anybody has ever created. Thank you. Uh, the second question is for, for Jeff Immelt. We know of your work as uh, Chair of President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness. What do you think is the most important thing that the federal government can do to help businesses in cities create jobs? Uh, in other words, I think both the mayor and you have focused on the role that the city has in actually being the source of innovation, being the source of entrepreneurship, and being the source of job creation. So what, what do you think the government can do specifically to aid cities and, and, and recognize the role that cities play in the overall economic machinery of the nation? You know, Mary, again, I think you know, Mike probably knows more about this particular topic than I do. But I, I you know, when, when we've thought about it, it's, it's infrastructure, entrepreneurship, investment, regulatory simplification, and education. So those are the big five that the Jobs Council has looked at. If I pick two of them, and, and Mike hit, hit a number of them in a speech, something around infrastructure. Okay, so a lot of that's going to have to be executed in a local place. Now, this could be simple things like retrofitting commercial buildings. Uh, that would create uh, thousands of jobs in New York City to get them up to a more current standard. These are the people that are currently unemployed. You've, you've got more than two million construction workers out of work. The only way those people are going to come back to work is in infrastructure. So we have a thing called the Better Buildings Initiative. I think this is eminently financeable in the private sector. But it's, but it's standards, it's regulations. In some ways, it's just letting the city do its thing and letting it go. I, th I think that's number one. The second one, I, th I think, is in the area of just education. You know, we, we have big pockets of unfilled jobs today that we just don't have people trained to do. And the best thing that the government can do in the short term is to, is to create programs that can unleash community colleges and things like that to get people trained. I think mayors are problem solvers. Mayors have more freedom to operate. They have more freedom to execute. Um, they can move faster. And, and that's where you know, I'd go. The last point I'd make is, look, um, we need growth. Growth creates jobs. We need growth. Growth creates jobs. We need growth. Growth creates jobs. The government should get up every day and say those words. 
We, we work on so many things as a country today that have nothing to do with solving the problem. And, and, and I find that to be completely mind-numbingly unacceptable. And, and I just think we, we, we're not all in on this problem. And I just think, Mayor, a lot of it's just tone. We need growth. Growth creates jobs. I think Mike has a way of doing that, of really focusing in on solving the problem. But as a, as a country, I just don't think we're all in on solving the problem. And that starts in Washington. It goes through every business, you know, and it goes through every city. Either of you, I, you both spend a considerable amount of time in Washington, and you know all the key players in Washington. Not so uh, much. Not so <laughs> Seriously. Much. I sell jet engines, really. That's, a, uh, that's I mean, what I do. It, 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 does Washington understand the role that the cities are playing and can play and should play? in actually being the engines for innovation and, and growth and job creation? I would argue no. If you take a look at most of the elected officials in Washington, they came up through, they may have started in the city government, but they came up through state government and then they would argue, it's not clear it's true, but they would argue moved up the ranks. I don't know why we don't think some of the other levels of government are just as important. I would argue city government is the most important in terms of delivering services and, and influencing people's well-being. But when federal government, for example, has a program, they distribute money never to cities, they distribute it to the states. And states, if you think about it, have typically a bicameral government, one house based on population, one house based on geography. Uh, the founding fathers had a great idea, but they never stopped to think that you need both houses so either one can stop things at, as opposed to both get working together. And, and so what they do is they tend to distribute the monies around to every place whether they need them or not. And you just have to go around and look in this country, the number of small cities that have hazmat trucks, where there's no reason to worry about terrorism or hazardous materials. Um, but everybody had to get some. And you can go right down the list. There's an awful lot of that. The bottom line is 50% of the people live in the big urban areas. It'll be 70% soon. If they distributed monies directly to where the services were needed, they would have a much greater impact with those dollars, whereas the current process has so much of a spread out, not waste, but a spread out that it doesn't get to where the real problems are. And I don't think they understand what goes on in the cities. Mayors typically don't go on to other jobs, and the reason is that mayors have to be explicit. Mayors can't have both, be on both sides of every issue. You know where a mayor stands, yes or no. The press is there every day, even in small cities. And uh, at the legislative side, you can say, well, I'm in favor of it, but we need more study, or let's have a pilot program, or that sort of thing. That doesn't sell at a local level. The public wants their garbage picked up. They want crime down. They want their schools better. They want to reduce their taxes and help their businesses get going. I think, Mayor, Healthcare is the case in point where there is no such thing as national health care. It doesn't exist. It, it's done city by city by city. And if we want to bend the cost curve, if we want to improve quality, if we want to do all the things we have to do as a health care system, we should be encouraging 50 mayors to have great entrepreneurial programs on what, where we go with health care. And that's, that, that hasn't been a part of any of the health care reform debates. You know, we, we're a big payer. We're a $3 billion payer. We've got hundreds of thousands of G employees and their retirees, and I can look out over, let's say, 20 cities. The span of quality and cost in these 20 cities is massive. And so that's, I, I think that's a case where if, if you turn, the, the cities are where the action is on, on that one. And, and that's one that I think we get, we, we've sub-optimized by thinking about it too much on a national basis. Too politicized. Well, definitely that, yeah. All right, L let me pose a second question which rolls into that particular question. You're known for putting in programs and strategies that actually get executed on the ground as you're moving forward. And 
you're putting in programs and plans and strategies now that will be executed in two, three, four, five, six, seven years' time. What are the challenges for, for, for you and therefore for New York City in two, three, four, five years to make sure that, that, that the strategies that you uh, have initiated and are already executed and the ones that are in the process of being executed actually move forward and, and get executed going forward? What are the challenges in making that happen? Well, a lot of people think uh, when we execute some of these strategies, they'd prefer to execute me, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Um, the things that really matter are not the day-to-day -day things that grab the headlines and that the uh, editorial writers write about. They are the long-term things that impact whether we're going to have a future or not. They are investments in education where you really can't see the payoff for years. They're the investments in infrastructure. Uh, this country has woefully failed to keep its infrastructure up to date. We haven't had a new a big infrastructure program in America since Eisenhower's interstate highway system. Uh, but if you go back and look, whether it was the Erie Canal or the Transcontinental Railroads or, uh, you know, those kinds of things had enormous impact. Um, and the problem with the big infrastructure stuff is the payoff is down the road. You don't know how much it's going to cost because you're dealing through so many different economic cycles and uh, changes in government while you go and do these things, uh, it's very difficult to explain to the public why they should reach into their pockets today and have less money for them to spend on the fun things in life because that will give, this will give their children a better life. New York City, I'm happy to say, New York City taxpayers have, not just under our administration, but under others, reached into their pockets. Today, every single bridge in New York City, and we have something like 750 bridges, every single one is up to standard, with the exception of a few ramps onto the Brooklyn Bridge, and every night we create a traffic jam, because we're working on that, fixing that. We've built a new subway system, an extension down the west side, which will open up an enormous amount of jobs, and businesses, and stores, and housing. And we had to do it with city money because the state would not come up with any money. But the New York City taxpayers reached into their pockets once again to do that. You know, and you can go right down the list, the new water tunnel so that we'll have a future, all of these things. But it really requires uh, an administration and those that before me did it and those, uh, some of them, and those that succeed us, I hope will do it, of leading from the front, bringing the public along, getting them to do these things, even though the administration that starts the program isn't going to be in office when the ribbon cutting is there. They just are in office when you have to come up with the money. And even though the public who's paying for it may not ever even realize the benefit. The benefit may be 10 and 20 years down. And if you want to know big things, reducing bureaucracy, uh, Seth and Bob's ideas on an, other universities coming here, though, all of the infrastructure that we've done, the new roads, those programs, those are the things that really matter, but they are difficult sells because everybody says we can postpone those till tomorrow. What's the difference in a 20-year infrastructure project if we start it now or next year? And you never want to start it in good times because you're worried about other things, and you certainly don't want to do them in bad times because you don't have the money. But if you go back and look at this worst part of New York City, modern day, the worst uh, things done that had long-term disastrous consequences, it was in the 70s walking away from infrastructure investments, letting the bridges rot away, uh, not working on our schools, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Thank you. Jeff, if, it, it might be helpful if you could give us a specific example of a, a GE city public-private partnership in, 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 in which you, GE has worked with the city to actually execute a project and or how you make sure that when you're no longer the CE and the mayor of the city that you've been working with and that administration is no longer in office, how, how you ensure that, that, that it executes going forward, as, as, as the mayor says, you know, you could, it doesn't end when, when the administration changes. How do you keep it going? And do you have any examples of, of You know, Mayor, I, I'd say the best, the best, the broadest and probably the most noteworthy examples we have are around the Olympics. You know, we're, we're an Olympic sponsor. We've done this uh, since Torino. 
uh, basically the way it works is that we've, we, we basically have the infrastructure space, so whether it's Beijing or Rio or London, and we're able to come in and work with a city in a very comprehensive way and work on their energy, you know, clean energy platform or, or an electric vehicle project. And we can bring a whole solution. So we bring not just technology, but financing, uh, services, all the things that kind of come with it. So, you know, we're doing, we probably did a billion dollars, close to a billion dollars of business in Beijing. Uh, we hope to do about that much in Rio. We'll do a lot in London. And those are the most big and fun. Now it goes all the way to, we've, we've done with uh, Mike a number of clean energy projects. We do street lighting. I mean, we do a number of things that kind of go with it. And, and I'd say that the, uh, one of the things I think we always want the company to be known for that's part of our culture is that we're a good partner. You, you know, we're, we're trustworthy. We, we uh, do what we say we're going to do. And I think that's the part of the culture that lasts far beyond me in terms of, you know, where it comes to uh, working with the city, which is we're, we know how to do solutions. We use our breadth as an advantage, but we have staying power and, and we'll find a way to get stuff done. Now, I, I actually, I think the great sporting events are, are, are excellent examples of that. Have yeah. Being originally from South Africa and, and, and observing everything that happened as a result of so the, the World Cup, Cup. including the, yeah. uh, the fast speed train, that, that has legs that will go for a very, mm. very long time. Mm. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I, I, I did note that there were pieces of paper on the, uh, on the chairs and uh, if any members of the audience had questions that they uh, wanted to ask and uh, Esther, I assume, has screened them very carefully. Uh, so we'll take a couple of questions from the audience if you're comfortable with that. Thank you, Esther. So obviously we have to take the first question because it comes from a student at Columbia Business School. How can you help international students to create their businesses in the U.S. and not in their own home country? So I guess it's the immigration. First by giving them permanent status here so they can stay. Awful hard. There's literally, I was talking yesterday to somebody who has a business in America but runs it from Canada. He's the CEO. Business is in Seattle, I think, and he is just north of the border. I mean, this is craziness. Unless you can get them to come here and stay here, well, they come here for education. Unless they can stay here, they can't create businesses here. After that, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs. They'll live through just about anything. They'll find a ways around almost any problem. But if you can't come to America and stay in America, you can't do that. And We'll try to compete with other cities, arguing New York is more diverse and more interesting and intellectual capital, your employees that you're going to need to hear. But the first thing is changing our immigration policies. So, Mayor, this is from the jobs plan. When a company routinely lets talented workers slip away, it's called mismanagement. When America does the same thing, it's called politics as usual. At a time when growth is sluggish and jobs are scarce, in an era which brains are the only sure source of lasting competitive advantage, it's wrong that America pushes talented immigrants away. It just is, you know, we have so many of these things that, again, if you, if you thought jobs was a crisis, you'd wake up tomorrow morning and you'd do something differently. And we, we haven't started this process of actually starting to do things differently. You know, that's, that's, that's you know, we talk about it or we, you know, I, quite honestly, I can't read another op-ed piece or listen to another speech. You know, it's just okay. Let's go. We got a list of ten things. Let's get some. Of, let's do two today. You know, it is and both sides of the aisle and both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. However, yeah. it is all of Washington. They've just got to stop this craziness and start working together on the big problems. And this is arguably one of the biggest. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Next one comes from a. Uh, a member of the EDC, so I'm going to give it to Jeff. Basically, the question is, are we, and in the end, will we have to concede clean energy technology development and production to China? Well, I, I, I'd answer that, like, what I would tell you is GE is going to win. Okay, so I, 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 don't, I don't want you to, I don't want anybody to be mistaken. I don't need, uh, 
Hope so. We're, we are all in. We're going to invest what it takes. You know, we just opened a, a last week, two weeks ago, a, a $400 million investment in thin film solar technology. Because I know by, you know by 2020, this is going to be at least a billion dollar product line. I don't care about Solyndra or any of that other stuff. We, we did this with no government funding. We can do this stuff, right? So I, I know we're going to win. Now, you know, China's moving as a country. They have both scale, and because they have a central government, and because this is now a big feature of the next five-year plan, they're going to they're going to build solar, they're going to build wind, they're going to build electric vehicles, and they're going to do them in a scale that's far vastly superior to the U.S. So, I, I just think it's you know I had a boss when I was early in my career, and he used to. And he was a tough guy, and he used to say, you know, Jeff, to do something, you have to do something, right? That's the way I feel about clean energy in the U.S. If you want to lead, you actually have to lead. You can't, you can't talk about it. You actually have to do things. And because scale is such a big deal in energy, that it's, it's why I worry a little bit about, uh, about us. But I, I think as an American company, I know we can win. And, and the question is, as a country, are we going to be able to create the same number of jobs that are going to be created? You know, we're having, and again, I think this is a, it's fair to be critical on Solyndra. But, but make no mistake, in, in India and China, between now and 2020, there's going to be 200 gigawatts of solar power. So let's not lose the forest, you know, for the trees. It's not like something's inherently wrong with solar energy. The rest of the world is moving quickly in that space. So that's... And during that time, we have presidential candidates who don't believe in science. I mean, just, just think about it. Can, can you imagine a company of any size in the world where the CEO said, oh, I don't believe in science, and that person surviving through the end of that day? Are you kidding me? It's, it's mind-boggling. Uh, let me get one more question before we, uh, we come to the break. Uh, this comes from a student at the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, what role does sustainability and investments in green energy technology play for stimulating New York City and other cities' economic growth? What, what role does sustainability and investment in green technology play? Well, Jeff talked... And how long do you have to keep at it? No, Je Jeff talked before about if you were to uh, change all the boilers that burn number six fuel and convert them to natural gas, you'd create a lot of jobs. You'd also get rid of an enormous percentage of the pollutants in the air. Uh, John Lindsay said when he was mayor he'd never breathe air that he couldn't see. It was a very cute thing, but think <laughs> about what you were doing to people's lives and lungs. Today, life expectancy is a year and seven months greater than it was ten years ago, and a lot of that's from cleaning up the air or people who've started to do it before. Uh, it is easier to attract young people who they want to go to cities where the cities are focusing on the future. Companies use it as a competitive advantage, saying we are very environmentally friendly. We're trying to clean up and do our part. It's a very big part of recruiting young people. Um, there's a good economic potential in there. You know, you, you, in this day and age, no matter what you hear from a handful of um, doubting Thomases or maybe people who are just trying to milk a political issue, uh, it's moved, environmental st space has moved from discussion and innovation into actual action. And people, companies today are doing things. Maybe not as fast as we would like, but New York City has this commitment by 2017 to reduce our, uh, the city generated, meaning city buildings, city uh, vehicles and that sort of thing, by 30%. The whole city by uh, 2030, 30 percent, and we're well on our way. We're actually doing things. We're finding ways to get big trucks off the road. We're finding ways to um, go and use less energy, which saves the pollutant. Is, is a very green thing. You don't have to clean up energy. You just use less. But this country it comes back to the same thing. We talk about energy independence and then do nothing about it. We talk about uh, helping people who are sick and don't do the basic thing of trying to keep them from getting sick in the beginning, and this is a part of it. It goes on and on. Jeff. So I'd say half, probably half of the clean energy technology is best applied at the city level. The, the things that are best done nationally, like clean coal or, or uh, 
a super efficient gas turbine. That's best done on a bigger scale. But everything around electric, you know, if you think about electric vehicles, electric vehicles work. They exist. Now, whether or not it's a fringe or a big, uh, uh, big part of the consumer market, all has to be decided in cities. It's all about infrastructure, business model. That's not going to be done federally. That's going to be done in New York City. Smart grid, same way. Uh, building retrofits, same way. So there's a big chunk of clean energy that uh, is going to be decided on the city level. And we see it you know, traveling around. I see it traveling around the world. I mean, the Chinese cities are really where most of this is taking place, same way in Europe. Uh, Mike's been a leader here. And, and then everything Mike said is true. Next generation. This is the way we recruit. It's what kids want to work on. They're smart about it. They, they, they know. And, and it's, in the end, it's not. this doesn't require lots of new invention. This is really business model innovation, and it just needs some local people to help drive it. Ladies and gentlemen, I promise to keep uh, us on schedule. We have uh, a long day today as, as well as tomorrow. I think we've heard from uh, two individuals who actually I think have been very encouraging about the future of our great cities and the future of our great companies working together with our great cities and uh, we now ask them that they should also address Washington for, for, for us in addition to the cities. Thank you Mayor Bloomberg Great. and Jeff.